Good evening, and welcome to the first uh, mini conference, uh, Ulster County History Mini Con Conference of the 2022 se season. Uh, and uh, I'm glad so many people uh, showed up this 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 evening. It's wonderful, and I know you're going to enjoy this presentation a lot. Um, one of the goals we have had is uh, over the last few years is to expand the narrative of uh, Ulster County his history. And one of the things I have tried to do is to find e exemplary pro projects uh, that um, can help us uh, as we unearth uh, the information because the kinds of things we're looking at now are uh, of course, are, are from primary sources, and it's a very difficult uh, process to tease from all of the evidence, uh, find the story, where do you go, how do you find out, how do you piece things to, together. And when I first saw the film um, where uh, slavery died hard, I was very in, impressed by the amount of work that uh, Wendy and uh, the uh, person who was involved with with her in the uh, project, um, where they, you know, how they went about it, uh, it's 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 great. So I'm very happy that she agreed to do this. I'm very, uh, this this evening. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce you though to Susan Sprackman because the way we're going to handle the questions to tonight ra rather than interrupting the speaker uh, we're going to put them in the chat so if you have a question as we go on uh, put it in the chat you won't see the chat on the screen because the only people that will see the chat is the person that's running the program and Su Susan um, but I'm going to introduce introduce you to Susan uh, Spr Sprackman now so she can tell you the way we're going to run the uh, Q&A this evening. Hi, everybody. So I'll be pulling information from the chat when you put in questions. And if there are a few questions about the same topic, I'll try to group them together and ask them to Wendy, ask them of Wendy as, as a group. Um, and then we'll see how it goes. And um, if we run out of questions in the chat, then we'll open the floor up and you can raise your hand and we'll call on people to ask questions directly. But we'll hold that until the end of the session. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Susan. So, um, well, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to Wendy E. Harris, um, who will we'll be doing to tonight's uh, pre presentation. And she's the co-author with Arnold Pick Pickman of the of the documentary where slavery died hard, the for, forgotten hi, history of Ulster County in the Schwangunk Mountain re, region. Uh, both uh, she and Arnold are archaeologists, and in tw 2001 they uh, performed um, they they formed Cra Cragsmore con Consultants. Uh, their Ulster County projects have included investigations for the Open Space Institute, the uh, Nature Conservancy, the, the Historical Society of Shuangunk and Gardner, and the Joint Ellenville Town of Awarsing Historic Preservation Co Committee. Prior to this, Wendy served as staff ar archaeologist for the New York D District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. While well, Arnold acted as a principal investigator for numerous New York City ar archaeological projects. Among their publications is a co authored chapter on the Hudson River ice industry, appearing in SUNY Press's The Environmental History of the Hudson R River. So it is a pleasure now to turn uh, the evening over to Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh... <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Wendy Harris, the co-author of the video documentary, Where Slavery Died Hard. Um, on behalf of my co-author, Arnold Pickman, and um, the Craigsmore Historical Society, who um, 
who produced the video, I'd just like to thank Jeffrey Miller, the Ulster County Historian, and Suzanne Hausberg, Director of the um, Ulster County Historical Society, for organizing and hosting tonight's event. I'm going to start by describing how our video documentary came to be, and then share some of my research, um, some of my experiences researching the history of enslavement here in Ulster County. Uh, the plan is to do this in under 30 minutes so that there will be adequate time for Q&A afterwards. Or, and, and also, please excuse me for reading from my notes, because this is the only way I can stick to the time frame. So for the last six years, I've immersed myself in an aspect of Ulster County's history that until recently I was only vaguely aware of its relationship with enslavement. Uh, as far as Arnold and I have been able to determine, 1663 is the earliest record of an enslaved person, an, una an unnamed man living here who was listed in that year as among those who lost their lives uh, when the county's original Native American inhabitants, the Sopus peoples, attacked Wiltwick, now Kingston. And significantly, he had been held in bondage by one of the first white settlers to acquire land in Ulster County, that was Thomas Chambers. This date, 1663, suggests that as a result of New York State's excruciatingly gradual emancipation laws in which people were held in some form of bondage until 1848, slavery existed here in Ulster County for a period of nearly 200 years. And I would like to add that although I'd worked professionally in archeology span and historic preservation most of my adult life, was born and raised here in Ulster County, the town of Warsing in Ellenville, and was the daughter of a local historian, I still knew very little about the subject. Uh, the video documentary, Where Slavery Died Hard, was an effort undertaken by the Cragsmore Historical Society in the hopes that we could make others um, in Ulster County, especially in um, areas close to Cragsmore, aware of this history and its implications for understanding who we are today in the 21st century. Tonight, I'll be describing the origin and development of the project, as well as sharing some of what I've learned about the process of researching Ulster County's history of enslavement. But first, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Cragsmore Historical Society, the, organi the organization that's responsible for producing this video. First of all, we're located in the town of Waworsing in Cragsmore, a small unincorporated hamlet that's located um, on top of the Shangong Bridge. The Historical Society was formed in um, 1996 by longtime resident Sally Matz and several others. Its headquarters are in Cragsmore's Historic Federated Church, originally constructed during the 1880s and restored with a historic preservation grant from um, New York State Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Cragsmore Historical Society board member Larry Goldbrecht wrote the grant application and then went on to act as general contractor for the restoration itself, which was completed in the spring of 2019. Today, we have a membership of 160 households, um, including some life members and honorary members. 20 different states are represented along with one member from Canada. Since 2006, the society has published the Cragsmore Historical Journal three times a year. And I trace the beginning of the evolution of the video back to an article Arnold Pickman and I wrote for the journal in 2015 as part of a series we were doing on Cragsmore's earliest white settlers. And as you may remember from the video, it was during this research uh, this research for the article that we discovered an enslaved child, a boy under the age of 14, as he was listed in the census. He lived here during the early 19th century, held in bondage by a local farming family. And about the same time, we were also working on a landmark nomination for the joint town of Allen, um, town of Worsing Allenville Historic Preservation Commission, during which we discovered that the house in question 
the DeWitt Benedict House, located just outside of Ellenville, had also contained at least 11 enslaved men, women, and children during its long history. So between the enslaved Cragsmore child and those held in bondage in the DeWitt Benedict House, we now had clear documentary evidence of enslavement in the town of Warsing. In response to this revelation, all I could do was ask myself, how could I not have known this? As explained in the video, Arnold and I then decided it was time to learn more about this particular aspect of the um, area's history. And we knew we needed a county statewide context for our research, but we also wanted to keep the focus as local as possible, specifically on the towns of uh, Waworsing and Shangunk, both of which occupied portions of the Shangunk Bridge bordering Cragsmoor. And at this point, we began a year's worth of research, which culminated in a slide talk, a slideshow and talk presented uh, on June 4th, 2016 at the Cragsmoor Historical Society's head, head, headquarters at the Federated Church. So our title had the same, um, it, had, it had the same title as the video we would eventually become involved in. And its accompanying narrative was the same as were many of the images that would in time find their way into the video. So much to everybody's surprise, on the day of the slideshow and talk, it was standing room only. In fact, a much larger and more diverse audience had come to Cragsmore than we, were, than we were used to seeing at these kinds of events. In part, this was due to the Historical Society's outreach efforts, but it also indicated that there was great interest out there in the subject matter presented. And from this was born the idea proposed by one of our members, the late Walter Alvarez, of reaching a wider audience by transforming the slideshow and talk into a video documentary. That spring and summer, an incredible group of volunteers, local volunteers came forward off offering to help out. All were from Cragsmore or had some relationship to Cragsmore and they brought an amazingly wide array of skills and talents to the project. Among them was an independent filmmaker and director of a workshop in Manhattan that he had founded to teach video and film editing. Um, and because he had other commitments that summer, he offered us his best student who happened to be a, a retired Broadway stagehand. Before leaving for the summer, he also recorded the narration for the um, video and read by another Cragsmore resident who was an award-winning uh, audio uh, narrator of audio books and also uh, had a long career as a stage and television actor. Yet another Cragsmore resident had worked for years in the music industry and he managed to get in touch with the folk blues bluegrass musician Rhiannon Giddens, co-founder of the Grammy Award winning Carolina Chocolate Drops. And she ag agreed to give us rights to use her um, music for our soundtrack. And finally, three local photographers, all known for their stunning photographs of the Shangunk Ridge and the Rondout River Valley, volunteered their time and photographs. And all of this was overseen and coordinated by Walter Alvarez, the originator of the entire concept. The documentary had its premiere at Craig's, Craigsmore Stone Church in October, 2018 and would soon win awards from the Greater Hudson Heritage Network and the Museum Association of New York. And since then, it has been screened throughout the Hudson River Valley and shortly before the beginning of the pandemic at Fordham University. And just last week, it was screened by the Ellenville NACP as part of their observance of Black History Month. We have never applied for or received any grants for this project. And other than everybody's time and energy, the only expenditure has been $200 to make DVDs of the video. The cover design for the uh, DVDs case, which was featured in the announcement for, the, for this presentation was created by Walter's talented art student daughter. So during summer months, Mary Sokoloff, the Cragsmore Historical Society's president, Maureen Rattle, the editor of the Cragsmore Historical Journal, and I gather together to package and mail out DVDs, 
all of which we provide for free to schools, colleges, universities, historical societies, libraries, etc. And in the letter that we have written to accompany the DVD, we explain that it is our hope that the video will quote, contribute to a body of knowledge verifying the significance of the African American presence in this region and that the sharing of the video will open dialogue on the historical impact of enslavement on all parts of our country, including New York State, and serve as a vehicle for understanding and reconciliation. And this remains our hope today. So um, tonight I'm also gonna talk about my experiences researching the history of enslavement in Ulster County. And obviously this is gonna reflect my own research interests, which include the legal infrastructure of slavery in Ulster County, mapping the regional landscape of slavery here, and the relationship between slavery and the county's early Dutch reformed churches. Also the portions of the county that I've mostly been focusing upon are what were historically its rural hinterlands, including the town of Shangunk, Marbletown and Rochester, and also those portions of Rochester that became the town of Worsing in uh, 1806. To begin with, I have found several especially useful local resources and repositories for researching the history of enslavement in Ulster County. And one source that comes to mind is the historic Huguenot Street's online digitized collection, The African American Presence in the Hudson Valley, easily found and viewed online as part of the New York Heritage Digital Collections. There's also historic Huguenot Street's online archives, part of their Schoonmaker Research Library located on Huguenot Street in New Paltz. And it's my understanding that many of the documents housed there were collected by the late Kenneth Hasbrook, who was both the founder of the Huguenot Historical Society, as well as the former town of Shangunk historian. And not so long ago, I found there what was for me a very significant original document, the late 18th century last will and testament of a revered Dutch reform minister directing his wife to put a number of their enslaved women, men, women, and children up for auction in order to pay off debts. Another great um, repository is the Haviland Hyde Guard um, collection at the LT Memorial Library. And then there are others, of course, which I have yet to visit and explore. However, I'm gonna donate this evening to discussing the documents I've encountered during research at a very well-known local repository that most of you are probably familiar with, the Elster County Clerk's Archives Division located on Fox Hall Avenue in Kingston, a repository that I found a bit overwhelming when I first began my research, but like nearly all research facilities of this kind, there's a bit of a learning curve involved and there's a wealth of information to be found here once you figure it all out. And also in my experience, the staff there is incredibly welcoming and helpful, especially the senior archivist, Taylor Brook, who is also the Kingston City Historian. Over the course of three years, I've spent many hours in the archives uh, doing research for my most recent project, which I will briefly describe. In the early 18th century, New York's Provincial Assembly passed a series of laws borrowed from the slave societies of Barbados and South Carolina. Historians call these laws slave codes. Once enacted and adopted in New York, these established a completely separal, separate legal system for the enslaved population consisting of especially harsh legal processes and procedures that deviated greatly from the existing English common law. Among these new process and processes and procedures were those created for prosecuting enslaved people accused of both capital and non-capital offenses. And what I have been investigating is how these laws have played out for the enslaved people who were brought, who were accused of such crimes often in the hinterlands, and then brought to Kingston for trial. So to go back to the archives, the basic organizing principle in the county archives is that most of the documents you'd want to look at are stored in what are called bankers boxes. The contents of each box might contain um, 
the contents of each box are described in special record reports to help you decide which boxes might have the material relevant to your research interests. To narrow this down a bit, you will end up, um, it is, it's, if you're interested in researching the history of slavery in Ulster County, you will probably end up um, doing much of your research in the archives special 101 box collection consisting of 101 boxes holding many of the oldest records in the county. Working with this collection should be pretty straightforward, but in my case, after two or three days of going through boxes, I discovered that the boxes I was in search of were not the boxes, um, I, that the documents that I were looking for were not in these boxes. You see, I was looking for boxes of documents um, devoted to regular criminal matters. But as it turned out, these were the wrong boxes. And this is because as a result of the slave codes, criminal matters involving enslaved men and women had been shifted out of the courts that generally tried criminal offenses committed by the white population. Beginning at the end of the first decade of the 18th century, trials for the enslaved were placed under the jurisdiction of the justice, justices courts, where traditionally, traditionally lower level offenses were um, tried and which were presided over by justices of the peace, most of whom were without any legal training or background in the law. These justices tended to be the wealthier and more powerful members of the community. And most, as my research um, into their lives revealed, were enslavers themselves. Although most of the criminal, although most of the other criminal courts and the traditional um, justices courts followed English common law, it seemed that much of what we would recognize today as an early version of due process was no longer being followed uh, during meetings of the justices courts while they were functioning as slave courts. And as it turned out, the slave courts documents contained important information, but it was somewhat fragmentary, uh, especially when it came to uh, trials where people were being enslaved, people were being tried for capital offenses. I was very fortunate though, because I was able to offset this by looking at another set of documents that are part of the 101 box collection. The early minutes that the Ulster County Board of Supervisors kept of their meetings. There are two sets of these. The earliest set covering the years 1710 to 1730 and a second set covering the years 17, um, 1793 to 1806. Aside from some newspaper accounts, there's not much detail available describing the executions of enslaved men and women convicted of capital crimes here in Ulster County. However, as I discovered, the county supervisor's minutes contained entries itemizing the costs of two executions in an entry for 1803, the county sheriff submitted a list of the expenses he had incurred um, he incurred during an execution he'd seen the previous summer. These included costs for the construction of the gallows, costs for making the coffin, the costs of sewing the special clothing that the condemned wore to the execution, and the digging of the grave. Apparently, the county sheriff had also requested that the local unit of the regimental light cavalry provide a ceremonial performance at the event. Each of its 16 members was paid individually, and these costs were also reimbursed. In a 1730 entry for another enslaved person's execution, the justices had submitted a request um, that they be reimbursed for the cost of transporting this man accused of arson in Marbletown from the scene of the crime where he was tried. And then the justices also requested to be reimbursed for the cost of his trial. An additional cost included in the tally was for forging the fetters in which the enslaved man had been chained throughout this ordeal. Ultimately, he was convicted and sentenced to be burned at the stake most likely in Marbletown. 
the Board of Supervisors entries for matters involving the enslaved were not necessarily limited to such dramatic events as public executions, but also include the tallying up of the cost of lesser crimes like petty larceny, and also um, the cost of coroner inquests, some of which seem to me to be suggestive of instances where the enslaved may have taken their own lives. My sense is that the supervisor's minutes can serve as valuable sources of information, especially as they are specific to certain localities. And many of the entries contain the names of both the enslaved and the enslavers. So identifying the names of individual enslavers was actually a very important part of my research. I wanted to see how many of the slave court justices were actually enslavers themselves. And as it turned out, many were. A very early source for this kind of information is the 1709-10 tax list for each of the county's towns. And in this tax list, households were subject to special, a special assessment in that year based on the number of chimneys, fireplaces, and enslaved people that they possessed. Sadly, although, sadly though, although the, the archives re record report indicated that it was part of the 101 box collection, a careful search of the box within which it had been filed indicated that at some point it had been removed from its folder and not replaced. Luckily, I was able to locate a transcribed version of it in another source um, and for those who are interested, you can find it in the July 1931 issue of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society's publication, The Record, the Record which is available online to members. Another important source of information for the names of the enslaved and their enslavers are the court records for non-capital offenses allegedly committed by the enslaved. These cases were also tried in the justices, these justices courts that were functioning as slave courts. New York's slave codes tightly regulated the behavior and lives of the enslaved. Freedom of movement, the right to socialize with one another or with whites and to buy, sell, trade or to engage in any other form of business with one, or, with one another or with whites was now forbidden except with the permission of one's enslaver. In 1718, the justices heard a case brought before them by the constables of Kingston, alleging that a group of what was described as, quote, several persons and Negroes had apparently gathered together one Sunday to watch a boxing match held between enslaved men. The courts list 22 enslavers, and besides each one of these names are the names of the men they held in bondage, 24 in all. In 1741, the justices heard a case described as a great concourse and meeting of Negroes on Saturday last at the house of Mr. Abraham Stoutberg. The list of those implicated include at least 40 enslavers and at least 30 enslaved, once again organized so you can specifically identify the enslavers and those they held in bondage. In both the 1718 case and the 1741 case, all of the enslavers were fined because they were in violation of the law as defined in the slave codes. Also of note is that both of these cases provide a window into what must have constituted social life, entertainment, and a sense of community for enslaved men, even in face of the slave codes cruel provisions. Clearly this would have been the case with the 1718 boxing match. But I couldn't help but notice that the court minutes for the 1741 case, the great concourse and gathering, also referred to it as a, the frolic at Abraham Stroudsburg's. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a frolic as a scene of occasion, a scene or occasion of gaiety or mirth, a merrymaking, a party and further describes it as being associated with dancing and Sabbath breaking. And although the event was held in Kingston, the list of the enslavers indicated that some of the enslaved participants may have traveled from Marbletown to Kingston in order to attend it. And in those days, quite a distance have traveled by foot. 
So in closing, I want to suggest that one of the essential tasks for reconstructing this history is to trace slavery's early spread from its origins in 17th century Kingston into Ulster County's hinterland communities. For example, we know from the 1703 Ulster County census providing the number of, of enslaved in each town and from the 1709 tax list, list mentioned earlier that slavery became established in portions of Marbletown, Shangunk and Rochester uh, during the um, first decade of the 18th century. In filling out this picture, I've relied on some secondary sources, which I also recommend. Mark Fried's books on early Kingston and on Shangunk place names. Kenneth Hasbrook's booklet on the history of the town of Shangunk. Catherine T. Terwilliger's books and newspaper columns about early Wawarsing. Gustav Anjo's two volume compilation and translation of early Ulster County wills. And of course, Nathaniel B. Syl Sylvester's 1882 volume history of Ulster County. And finally, for more information on sources, if you look on the Cragsmore Historical Society's website, you can find a list of the sources Arnold and I used for researching our video. And for anyone interested in the quantitative and statistical aspect of slavery in Ulster County, Arnold's analysis of this is posted on our own website, which you could find by Googling Cragsmore Consultants. And that's it. Thank you. Questions and um, one of them is, um, were the black men who were boxing, were they doing it voluntarily? Is there any way that we can tell? I don't know. I, I would doubt it. I, I really don't know. It's not, you, I'm pretty much stuck with the information that was in the, in the court records. Yeah, okay. And um, Joan Kelly, uh, you put in some notes about some, uh, some documents that you have. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Oh. I'm sorry, some. Oh, some. Joan, Joan Kelly yeah. um, put in a, a note about some primary documents that she has. And do you want to share that? Sure. Can, is, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can so hear you. Yeah. In, in, the, in the video, you had um, quite, a seg quite a segment on the, the seating. This is, is this working? Yeah, I think, Wendy, there's something issue on your end in terms of um, echo on sound. Wait a minute, let me, let me put your phones on a minute. There, is that better? Yes, I think so. Okay. So, so there was quite a segment on the seating in the um, Schwangunk Dutch Reformed Church about the African Americans being in the balcony. So in the um, records of the Dutch Reformed Church of New Paltz, there's a seating diagram of 1839 that shows in the balcony separate sections for colored females and colored males. Really? And, um, the next row down is the students. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> they, even then, but um, the explanation is more likely the fact that the, the way churches were financed was by selling pews. Mm -hmm. So the um, most wealthy people would buy the most expensive pews, which were in the front of the church. And as you went back, the prices got cheaper and cheaper. Mm -hmm. So, um, they would only buy enough spots for the family mm -hmm. and um, African-Americans certainly could not afford to buy a pew. So that's why they were assigned the cheap seats up in the balcony. What, what year did you say the diagram was from? 1839. 1839. Okay, because um, we were looking at an earlier period um, well, that's that's I'd, another. I'd love. I really. That's a great. Um, I would love to see. Is is the diagram available? Is it in the um, collection? I think it's part of the the um, the 
the diagrams that Historic Huguenot Street is oh. currently digitizing. If not, I can I can make arrangements for you to get it. Okay. The other thing is that um, there is a statement that the Dutch Reformed Church um, discouraged um, proselytizing African Americans and and treated them poorly. As early as 1792, the Synod of the Dutch Reformed Church, which is the highest over writing organization um, issued a resolution to their constitution that said, no difference exists between bond and free in the church of Christ, slaves or blacks when admitted to the church possess the same privileges as other members of the same standing. Their infant children are entitled to baptism and ministers who deny them any Christian privileges are to be reprimanded. And what year is that again? 1792. Because we, you know, one, this is a while ago, but I did start to go through a lot of the records to see about baptisms of the enslaved. Okay. And, and that picks up, you're right. It does sort of pick up after a while. Back in-, but, in some, but, the, but the Shangung church, yeah, I have their, you know, I have their records and they're one of the only churches around here that, I can't find a single record of anyone being baptized. Of any so I'm going to I'm going to move us on, but I it sounds okay. like Joan and Wendy, you need that. Should get together. Yes. Yeah, yes. And, and, and and Josephine Bloodgood um, added a comment that she can put you in touch, Wendy, with Kevin Cook, the reform um, the church archivist, who will yeah. show you the diagram. Okay. Um, Paul Bowward said that he has relatives who lived in. Newburgh and the New Windsor and Washingtonville area. Do you know um, if the enslavement would have been differently different there? Um, it might have been. It might have been because the areas I was looking at were these farming areas. You know where you know the sort of um, like sort of the fertile bottomlands of the Rondout and the um, Wallkill, and I'm there probably would have been a. a the kind of enslavement or slavery that would be happening in Newburgh would probably have to do with the port, the mm -hmm. Hudson River port. And so that's something that I do not know anything about, but there's a lot, I, I, I know that there's a lot been written about it. And, um, you know, A.J. Williams Myers talks about it in his book, um, so. And Kwame Holmes asked, he appreciated the <laughs> presentation. And he asked if the tax records allow us to estimate the monetary value of enslaved people. Well, one way, a, a sort of a horrifying way that uh, there is a mo monetary values are given are for executions because they were reimbursed. The enslavers, if someone was, was executed, then the enslaver would be reimbursed. I can't remember the um, price, I mean, and again, it was, again, I'm dealing with, um, you know, 1730, so it's all in shillings, but, mm -hmm. um, but if there's, a, I mean, I can look, I've, I've got, I've got it in some of the records I've yeah. looked at. Yeah, okay. Um, Hildegard Pleva put in a question um, about examining the day book of merchant Peter van Gasbeck, and it mentions the sales uh, is she sells to Negroes or of Negroes? I'm not sure. Well, it, of Abraham, it's Abraham Van Gasbeck. Uh, Peter Van Gasbeck, okay. Peter. Because um, I've been looking at some of the Van Gasbeck wills because he was, uh, Abraham Van Gasbeck was a, one of the justices who, uh, and he was probably the, he, I think he owned he was the second wealthiest person in Ulster County, and I think he owned the second most number of slaves. But I've looked at some of those wills anyway. But yeah. Yeah. Peter must be his son. Yeah. We also have a question about how you determine the boundary of the slave cemetery. That again is something that, that one cemetery, you know, I, I was there the, when I took the when we took the photographs, that was the second time that we were there. I had been there a long time ago, and I remembered many more of those stones. So, 
but the person to talk to is Joe Diamond because I think he, he was the one who first found that cemetery mm -hmm. during um, a, a survey many years ago of that property. And, I, and I've talked to him about it, like how, you know, what, what made him think there would be a cemetery there. He had mm -hmm. a number of, of, you know, conditions that were, you know, he would look, he would expect a cemetery to be located and he would, he might have a better idea of the boundaries. Okay. We have a question about the, the video indicated that the kitchen used by the enslaved women to prepare the family meals in one of the homes was located in what seemed to be the basement of the home with a separate entrance. Because of fire and other considerations, these types of kitchens often were located in a structure separate from the house. Was this arrangement common in Ulster County or unique to this particular structure? I think in historic Huguenot, at historic Huguenot Street, at least one of the houses there, the, the, the kitchen is in within the structure, yeah. so. Yeah, and I've seen other stone houses um, that, that also have the side entrance yeah. to the basement, yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Um, that we that we have. Anybody want to raise your hand and and make some comments directly? Uh, Joan, I see you. <laughs> Just a short question. Um, have you located the slave register for Schwangung? The slave register. Where they had to register the children that were born after 1800. See, again, I'm, I've am i been working in a much earlier period. I, I'm pretty much been confined to the 18th century. Okay. Um, so a lot of the records, a lot of, you know, I, a lot of the records for Shangung have, as they said, walked, but I, my hunch is that Kenneth Hasbrook had them and may have put them at historic Huguenot Street. No, these would be town records, so they should still be in Chuangna. Well, I, I was unable to find the early town records there. Okay. okay. Uh, you know, okay. they, the, uh, the clerk okay. there now doesn't know of anything about them. Okay, Hildegard has her hand raised. I've unmuted you, Hildegard. Uh, thank you, this is terrific. Um, the Peter Van Gasbeck is the son of Abraham. Okay. He, he owned in the 1790 census, 12 slaves. Yeah. Uh, which I know, I think your video mentioned the largest number of slaves held was 15 by one family. Yeah. Um, the day book is the daily journal recorded in the store by clerks mm -hmm. of all the transactions day by day in his store, so to speak. Okay. And um, uh, scattered through this day book, which covers a, just under two years of days in the store, mm -hmm. it, it's indicated that the merchant, uh, the money was received or charged by, and the merchandise received by a Negro. Um, in, in one case, the Negro is described as a Schwartz wench, meaning black, Schwartz in Dutch, like German, is black. So a black woman, Schwartz wench, uh, received the merchandise. Um, so the, but these day books are very revealing, not necessarily about the lives of slaves, but revealing of so much other information. And uh, including the establishment of a secondary store in Middletown. So I'll be writing something about this at a future date. I'm working on archives held by the Friends of Historic Kingston. Okay, so he was in King, like his father. On North Front Street, he had, at the time of his death, he had a building across the street from the Senate House, which no longer exists on, at the end of Clinton Avenue, just before it joins North Front Street. He was uh, a major in the Revolutionary Army. He was a congressman in the Third Congress 
with a very good uh, frequency of voting record, I'm finding out. Okay. So I've been, I've been doing you. a lot of research about his father because he was one of the justices. He was the head, be he was Thomas Chambers' adopted son. Right. Right. And Lord, his father had been Lord of the Manor. That's anyway. whole, uh, that whole thing is very interesting because when he died, his uh, Sarah Dumont, who became Peter's wife, was his heir, his principal heir, not his son. That's a big mystery to me, yet to be solved. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a, a question from, from Helen, which I think many of us are thinking, how do you keep your spirits up while researching such a horrific topic? Oh, no. It was one of those pandemic projects. <laughs> I don't know. It, it does get, it, it, it does get pretty, um, you know, some of the stuff is, is pretty horrific, but I kind of felt that it was, it was important to know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it really got me. There's the description of you can identify this person because of the marks on his back. Okay, Mar uh, Marietta uh, commented that AJ Myers used to mention the Eagle's Nest. She thinks that's the name. Do you know anything about that? Um, is that where people used to escape? Um, I think it is up. It's, it's on the ridge um, just west of Hurley. I believe uh, there was another one, another similar community up there whose name I'm blocking. But but it, you know it, it, it was up to sort of you know overlooking the the floodplain of the Esopus and way up in that ridge that you can see from Uto Nine. Okay, um, Susan Stesson Cohn has her hand up. Um, uh, let me see. Are you unmuted, Sorry, no, Susan? Um, Karen, can you unmute Susan? Oh, oh, here we I go. I did. I think you I, muted. Here we go. Wait, am I there? Yeah, yeah. is it, Susan? Hey, Wendy. Hi, Susan. How are you? Hey. Um, question. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about what's the new discovery. I don't have all the details, but a few weeks ago, one of the archivists up at State Archives, oh, yeah. um, you heard know. about it. You might I, do you want to yeah. talk about it at all? Because I think it's pretty incredible. Yeah, I, you know, it, I just know that these are these records that people had just assumed were lost. For 200 years. Uh, for Journal <laughs> Truth's trial records, right? For, for getting her son back who had been um, sold into slavery, I guess, at a time right. when that was in the South. I, you know, I just got, I guess because I'm so caught up in all this stuff, I, I got, I just, the idea that it was um, 5,000, it was in 5,000 cubic feet of documents, they found it. And I asked Taylor Brooke about it, and he said, well, he that went just, up right. He said that he means they looked through 5,000 banker boxes before they found it. So, right, which was pretty and amazing. I have one, I have one um, case that I've been looking for um, of a, a 16-year-old enslaved girl who was um, accused of murdering her enslaver's six-year-old daughter was um, tried at the circuit court, which I think was those records ended up in the archives. And I had been thinking this summer I would go and try to find them. But when I heard about the 5,000 archive boxes, I just thought, I don't think I can do that. I, a pretty, I, I guess from what I heard, it was a pretty amazing find. I, I've seen it, but I think there's some new revelation in it about who the judge was, which I won't comment on yet, but I'll talk to you about it. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, it changes some of the story a little bit. So people it's had amazing. Just, people had, forgive, had given up hope, I think, that that was ever going to, that those records would ever surface. Right. So, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I want to, you'll have to tell me. <laughs> yes, I, I will. I'll send you a copy of it as well. Okay. So, um, and thank you for a wonderful presentation, as always, Wendy. So, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Okay, I think those are all the questions. Jeff, shall I turn it back over to you? Yeah. Okay.
Okay, okay. so uh, yeah, for for me, I mean, the thing that that stood out uh, as someone uh, who has um, it's how hard it is to find information. Uh, in the 1980s, when I was doing my work, there was so much, there was nothing di digitized. There were very few finding aids. And that was part of the joy of it. Because I would walk in, uh, my, my major area of research at that time was music in the Hudson Valley before the Civil War. And no one had done anything or thought anything about it. And uh, my dissertation advisor had told me the last place to look for music is under M. And so I found myself going into uh, wills, going into bankers boxes that had not been looked in for uh, at least three directors of the, of the uh, archive where I was. And that is really, when I was a teacher and people would say history is boring, I couldn't get them to understand that studying history in school is like learning the alphabet and phonics, that history begins when you take that kind of foundation of knowledge out into the field and try to make sense of the, of things and to find and to, and it's detective work and you have to find things that then lead you to other places serendipity plays a part because you happen to find evidence in one box that confirms something you thought from another box and it's and there's that other thing which which Wendy mentioned, uh, which I think is the most profound thing that we all have to keep in mind. It's very easy to make conclusions from what you have, but if you don't have the smoking gun, you, you know it, it's very hard uh, to. Um, and I've got a few things problems right now I'm working on, where I'm just looking for something to prove that something I think happened did happen. And you just don't find it in the evidence. So sometimes you just have to wait and maybe not find it ever. And, but it's, you know, when do you feel free to be able to take great leaps and say things? Or how do you say it? You know, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful, I mean, when you talk about slavery, it's a horrible thing that you're bringing to life. And it's a cruelty and it's hard to uh, imagine that people could have actually engaged in that. But when you're doing the research, it's like detective work and there's a kind of excitement to it because you're bringing into the light of day something that, um, has not, you know, been brought before, and it's found in little specks of evidence in in town halls, in major archives, in and it's hidden away in things like um, uh, wills, in in things like probate records. Um, you know, I found a, in a probate record, I found mention of a violin string. And there was money for it. Well, if there was, you know, if there was a violin string, there had to be a violin. I didn't find a violin. This was in 16 something or other, but it's a, it's a wonderful process, you know, and, and I would love to see more people get involved and in, in, in just tackling this, this question, you know, what was slavery really like? There are a lot of documents to go through and uh, there are a lot of people working on it and doing good, good work on it. And there are a lot of opportunities for more to happen. And I would love to see students get involved, high school students, you know, get more people in the archive, working under people that that uh, know this, you know, that have worked with these kinds of do documents before to help to um, 
nurture a whole new gen generation of local hi historians. So anyway, I do want to thank you uh, for this talk. I, I really appreciated it. And um, here we go from there. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again, and thanks everyone for uh, uh, coming to uh, hear this. And if you didn't see the video before this talk, please go back and see the video because it's very in, instructional and a wonderful effort uh, that, that was put into it, which is one more thing. Yes, I do wanna thank um, the people that helped me put these programs together because I'm just one person and I've tried to create a community of people that get together once once a month uh, to talk about these, uh, what do we want to do for conferences, what's going on, what's the recent re research, and um, I would love, you know, that, well, there's Audrey Klink Klinkenberg, who's my de deputy, uh, Richard Hepner, Woodstock historian, Susan Stesson Cohen, New, New Paul's historian, Suzanne Hausberg, the director of Ulster County Historical Society, Susan Sprackman. I don't know if you're still the president of that or if you've. I've stepped down, I'm the treasurer. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and Joan Kelly, uh, wonderful. Uh, you're the, uh, what was it, the town of? Lloyd. Town of Lloyd. <laughs> uh, Gail, Gail Manny. I'm not sure if Gail is here, but she's the town, uh, the town of Marbletown historian. Rob, Rob Sweeney's been with, with us a few times. He's the town of Ulster historian. And um, I would love to hear from people. Uh, my email is very easy. It's gmiller. Now the hard part, 1931 at gmail.com. And if anyone has a suggestion for uh, programs they would like to see us do, I would love to hear from, from you uh, because this is about building a community and communicating with one another. And um, so it goes. So thank you all, and we will see you next time. I will put out um, an invitation for uh, the next meeting that, that we decide to have. So thank you and good, good night. Okay.